go in a little bit closer, there's Chicago. Um, big birding areas here on the eastern seaboard. Go in even, even closer, this is the state of Ohio. That's where I grew up. And so I probably had something to do with that, that slightly darker point. Let's go to Europe. Now we get into some fun things because in order to work with biodiversity data, especially found biodiversity data, you have to be always thinking about the garbage factor. Okay, there's a lot of garbage. There's a lot of biases. There's a lot of stuff in there that we need to be paying attention to. Denmark has done a great job of dealing with its biodiversity data. Sweden has done a fairly good job, at least in the parts where there are people and not so much in the rural areas. And then we see, okay, there's for some reason some region of Austria. But then, then look at these other things that we see. Look at these regularly spaced points. That, that, look at England. What's that? Yeah, it's coarsely resolved data. Probably what it is is atlases, bird atlases, where you drop, divide the region up into squares and the georeference that you give it is the centroid. Okay, so somebody was probably on, under some pressure to get some biodiversity data out there. And it was like, oh, what the hell? And so they put out these atlas data that are really kind of dodgy as far as documenting the geography of these species. Way, way, way too commonly, going back to the niche modeling world, people just download the data and stick it into a niche model and don't look at the data. You have to look at the data very carefully and in as many and as creative ways as you can. Here's South Africa, okay? There's some atlas data in there. Now, at a coarse spatial resolution, that's good data. Remember what I said, point data are useful at any resolution coarser than their precision. There's some other data in there that are certainly useful. And you can see that South Africa is kind of an island in terms of data density. Here's Northwestern South America. This is a, this is a favorite of mine. Um, that's the country of Costa Rica. And you can see it is chock full of observational data. Why? I was in a taxi in Brazil last year and the taxi driver wanted to talk and he was asking me where I had been in the world and I, I gave him the list of the last year. And I, I mentioned Costa Rica and he said, oh, that's the country with all the biodiversity. <laughs> that's the country with all the biodiversity marketing. Okay, great national parks, good protection, wonderful marketing of, you know, come see our biological diversity. Compared to Brazil or Colombia, it's nothing, okay? But that's where the birders go. Then look at the country of Panama. This is another neat one. You see this big concentration? Anybody know what that is? This is your geography test of the day. <laughs> it's the Panama Canal Zone. It was a U.S. possession until what, the Carter era, late 70s? So then, let's come on into Colombia, and what we see are these kind of funny strings of data. Those are roads. Those are places where you can get into very remote sectors and actually get observations. Here's New Guinea, and here you can see political effects. Papua New Guinea, is more accessible than Indonesian New Guinea. And look at the density of points here versus here. Very difficult, very expensive, and a little bit dangerous to go to the Indonesian side, but more feasible to go to the Papuan side. And essentially, you see that reflected in the data. 
Here's for Kate. This is that observational data in the Southern Ocean. Those are amazing yeah. shipping lines. You're literally seeing individual ship tracks. And some sailor, you know, probably bored out of his socks, jotting down, oh, there's another albatross, now there's a petrel, jotting it down, clicking a GPS, and look at that. It, these areas are probably big fishing regions, these areas too, but you can see the ships just moving back and forth. So you see a lot of the bright red are not just fishing, they might also be uh, some of the southern Antarctic islands that you had different research vessels going out to, and they look at the breeding colors. Sure. So it's one of the two, but it's a, a planned definition. Sure, sure. And you can definitely see that the, the nexus for getting into the, that part of the southern oceans is Tasmania. Right? So, I mean, this is really spectacular. You can use those data to really, really good ends. Okay, so if we look just at the points on the Earth where there's any knowledge, the world looks like this. That's just where there's data. Okay? And what you should be noticing is the gaps, because we're talking about survey gap analysis. And essentially what you see is seven-eighths of Africa, a good part of South America, and much of Asia. Notice here, Australia is pretty empty. And now, post Atlas of Living Australia, it's filled in. So my concept of digital accessible knowledge, DAK, is much more volatile than any knowledge. From one day to the next, some big data set could be made accessible. And your map changes. So essentially what we're after now is looking at ways of, of generalizing this knowledge. I tried fitting surfaces to it, and that basically just blurred it, okay? So I ended up going out to that one degree resolution and calculating completeness indices. And so now where you see red are relatively complete inventories, and where you see blue are relatively incomplete inventories. Again, notice that Australia sucks here, okay? Uh, notice that North Africa is all but empty. Notice that Russia is all but empty. If you could just see the red squares, the map would look a lot more empty. So I was seeking essentially a metric, a global metric of knowledge of birds, knowledge of bird faunas and distributions. And so what I ended up cluing in on was I can just use the frequency distribution of sea values. And so there are two curves here, marine versus terrestrial. Let's take the terrestrial, which is the red one. And essentially what you're seeing is that most sites have, about 70% of sites have a sea value of zero in the terrestrial realm on the Earth right now. And then a, lot of, a relative lot of sites have um, low to moderate C values. No, sorry, I've got this completely backwards. Most sites on Earth have zero C values, a few have low C values, and only a very few have high C values. Okay? So we can see right away that terrestrial realms have a higher um, degree of knowledge than marine realms. You can see that right away. There's more white than there is gray. Okay? But essentially what we're using is the area under this, this frequency distribution, the integration of that, of that curve, as a measure, kind of an, an index of knowledge of birds in that, in this case for the whole world. So where I'm stuck is that we did this for, I think it was October of 2010. That's this view of the world for digital accessible knowledge. 
We have versions of this data set that go from 2007 to 2013. So I fixed all of the bird names for this data set, for the 2010 data set. That was 11,000 names. It took me two continuous months doing nothing else. I thought, okay, I have to catch up two years now. So, you know, I was thinking another two or 3,000 bird names. Another 11,000 bird names. So that's where I'm stuck. I've got to find some time to concentrate. The cool thing is, is we can get these metrics of completeness of knowledge of bird faunas for any region on Earth. You know, we can do a, a you know, Zambia curve. And we can track that through time. But essentially where, where I'm headed with this project is I want to see whether, you know, imagine that if we track these area, the areas under these curves through time, kind of without any plan, it's going to have little jumps where neat data sets come online. It's going to get better through time. But my question is if, by being strategic, we can increase that rate of improvement of global knowledge. So it brings you to really interesting things. GBIF a few years ago, I'll say in a, in a moment of lack of thought, set its goal of, okay, we're at 200 million data points right now. We want to be at 1 billion by 2010. Okay, there's a goal. Now, if you want a billion data records served through GBIF, how do you do it? I can do it. It's really easy. You take the huge observational data sets. Okay, Breeding Bird Survey, Christmas Bird Count in the US, eBirds already in. There's some big data sets in Europe, there's some big data sets here in South Africa. And if you count every individual as a record, you're going to be at a billion pretty quickly. However, if I look at a bird species in the US, we have a kind of a, a cool species. It's about as red as Jesse's shirt. It's called the cardinal. And neat crest. There's one that sings outside of my window every morning in the spring. Um, if I do a search on GBIF for cardinals, I get a quarter million records of one species. You don't need a model. Okay, you see every corner of the species distribution. You do not need a model. And we don't need any more cardinal points. Okay? We know the distribution of that species. We're not learning very much. I know that there are some analyses where we could learn something from those data. But it doesn't change this picture in any way. So that idea of setting the goal of a billion records was dumb. Instead, what you do for birds, as you say, I've got these spatial gaps. I might have certain taxonomic gaps, like I'm betting the uh, shearwaters and albatrosses and things like that. Taxonomic gaps, temporal gaps. I haven't looked at these data in terms of, of what months they come from. Uh, but whatever, whatever the gaps are, you should target those gaps strategically. So what I want to do with the World Birds Project is challenge the real adventure birding community. I mean, there are people who go out, spend all kinds of money to go to the far ends of the earth to see that last endemic, right? And my hope is that by showing some of these big gaps, we can motivate the birding community to pull data out of their old checklists and their, their trip records and things like that and get them online. And so the question is, again, if we track this metric through time, if this is what it does with no strategy, can we make it do that? 
by targeting particular areas in taxa. That's kind of where this is heading. Any questions about world birds? Okay, let's talk about plants in Brazil. So this is maybe a more relevant example. Um, Brazil is, I guess in theory, still a developing country, but it's pretty damn developed. Um, big economy, and it's been investing rather seriously in its science, which is really neat. Um, so colleagues at CRIA, which is an institute in the little city, kind of in southeastern Brazil, um, have been collaborating for the last several years with the botanical community and have created the Brazilian Virtual Herbarium. And essentially what it is, is about 80 some herbaria that digitized some or all of their holdings. Some of these are really big herbaria, so they're not done yet. Um, but they've digitized their herbarium holdings and shared them. And the taxonomic community has gotten together created a list of the species of plants of Brazil that they agree on, that they curate, that they maintain, and essentially a translation from the raw data to that list of, that authority list of species. So essentially this data set has gone through several rounds of cleaning. Okay, several rounds of, of seeking out the problems, fixing them, flagging them when you can't fix them. At present for uh, plants and fungi, it's about four and a half million records. And you'll see how that number comes down a bit. But during my sabbatical last year at CRIA, essentially we analyzed this data set from a bunch of perspectives. Um, so that's just kind of looking at the, the raw picture. The size of the circle shows you the number of specimens from that site. You can see it's a pretty dense view. But right away, you're doing a survey gap analysis. Okay, where are we missing surveys? You know, it's the Amazon, especially the southern part of the Amazon. I'm going to show you that result in a lot more detail. Um, there's a point that I want to make, and I want you to remember this. Um, we're going to talk about digital accessible knowledge leaks. Okay, essentially, where do you lose information? And one critical point about these data is that the georeferencing is a bit crude. It's essentially to, to centroids of counties. Okay? And that's been my argument with CREA for a number of years. Let's get those data georeferenced completely. But basically what we're talking about is kind of a 10 kilometer error radius. It gets a little bit or a lot broader as you go west.